Kareem Ainous's first English language film Firebrand plays out like a foggy memory, though that has little to do with the liberties it takes in warping historical facts as it sees fit. Firebrand essentially reshapes the content of Elizabeth Fremantle's Queen's Gambit to give the story of the queen who survived a more contemporary grit and a bold air of defiance. Calling it a biopic would certainly be a bit of a stretch. A spoiler warning ahead though as we will be discussing essential plot points and character details from the film. If you've watched it already, let's dive straight into the video. And while you're at it, please like the video and subscribe to our channel as it helps us a lot. Fremantle's book covers a bigger stretch of Queen Catherine Parr's life than Firebrand explores, so you might feel a little lost, especially if you're coming into it without any prior knowledge of what life was like for Tudor King Henry VIII's sixth wife before she married the abusive monarch whose gangrenous legs were inching to death. Catherine was married and widowed twice before she caught the king's eye, and the proposal from the king couldn't have come at a worse time too, considering Catherine was rather enamored by Thomas Seymour, brother-in-law to the king an uncle to Prince Edward. What Firebrand leaves out in his exposition is how Catherine actively pursued a reconciliation between the king and his children, Elizabeth, Edward and Mary. They were practically shunned from the Hampton Court after the king did away with their mothers in ways that came easy to him. What we're dropped into is a rather challenging part of Catherine's queenhood, playing regent in court while her husband's away waging war in France. Catherine plays this part with as much grace and constructive authority as she can conjure up, and of course, in the process, makes the patriarchal majority of the court frown at the idea of a woman. That too, the wife of a rapid narcissistic king, taking charge of the financial policies and religious reforms. Catherine's supposed allyship with the Samos, Thomas and Edward, over a similar Protestant sentiment didn't necessarily promise her protection in her radical pursuits. But the Queen's heart ached for the people of England, who only ever heard of God through the mouths of priests and in a language that they didn't understand. And that's where Anne Askew, a supremely popular Protestant, Protestant activist and Catherine's childhood friend came in. Catherine risked being termed a heretic to join the curious gathering of people, all looking up at Anne as she told them that they deserved to read what they were supposed to believe in in a language that they understood. And although this part seems fictional, a worried Catherine in Firebrand even gave Anne a necklace that had been given to her by the king so that her friend could see herself through the terrifying times of heretics being burned at the stake or beheaded. But the king's premature return home was a curveball that Catherine neither expected nor was emotionally prepared for. The king, who was rather easily disenchanted from his previous wives, did prefer Catherine's company more than he did anyone else's. But his affection for her in no way actually changed him. He was unpredictable even for someone as observant and shrewd as Catherine. Sure, he granted her a few crumbs of freedom here and there. She was one of the very few women of the time to actually publish prayer books in her own name. But how far he let Catherine explore her love for God for a more enlightened perspective varied on how how much pain he was in, what sort of mood he was in, and how pressured he felt by the brewing tension between the Protestants and the reactionaries in his country. What you hear in Anne Askew's statement about the time the king allowed the Bible to be translated in English was a reference to the time Henry had severed ties with the Roman Catholic Church in order to annul his marriage with Catherine of Aragon. Mary's mother. But the Church of England was breathing down his neck over the fire of religious reform that decision ignited. As the deputy of God, Henry had as much power to lose as the reactionary church if they were removed as the medium between the common people and God. So the king pulled himself back and allowed Bishop Cardinal to oversee religious policies according to the conventional restrictions on religious texts and sermons. His wrath rained down on anyone who was deemed a religious heretic, and the likes of Anne Askew were hunted down and killed without mercy. Rage clouded Catherine's self-preservation instincts when she heard of Anne's capture and execution. In real life, Anne was captured, tortured for information on her connections with the Queen, and eventually burned at the stake. In the film, Catherine going against her better judgement and reminding the King that Anne's death was on his soul got the kind of reaction that Anne once warned her about. The king was a paranoid beast, and as he crushed Catherine's face and muttered anxious questions about whether she wanted him to get hurt, we actually saw Henry being the abusive tyrant that Catherine didn't want to see him as. She wanted to believe that he respected her, and why wouldn't she when he'd left the reins in her hand when he went abroad? But Henry had her on a leash, with only enough liberty to walk around inside the boundary he had drawn for her. At the end of the day, 
Catherine wasn't much more than a nurse, carefully placing maggots into his festering wounds. She wasn't much more than the wife crushed under his weight as the smell of decay filled up their bedchamber. If he indeed had an ounce of respect for his wife, he wouldn't have blatantly flirted with potential mistresses right in front of her and a room full of people who could see how fickle his love for his queen was. Catherine was an eyesore for the likes of Gardiner. But more importantly, the entirety of the patriarchal church and court were threatened by a woman having more power and a stronger control over her fate than the more unfortunate ones that had come before her. Catherine was immensely respectful of the wives who'd been lost in the king's insatiable sense of entitlement, and that had likely played a part in her intense desire to uplift her stepchildren from their bastardized positions in the royal family. But much of Catherine's mind was occupied by the need she felt to bring God and his people closer. She was a devout Christian an intellectual when it came to literature and how it held the power to usher in hopeful change and an ardent social reformer who was pained by the way the church dictated people's take on sin so gardiner took it upon himself to intimidate her with the fear of the death sentence catherine held her own for as long as she could reminding him every step of the way that she perceived devotion in its sincerest form but in the overarching power play a woman even a royal one was vulnerable to all sorts of unfair scrutiny and condemnation she still held some influence over the king's decisions when she was pregnant with a child Henry desperately wished was a boy heir but word of mouth got to him and even more than his concern over her radical reformatory ideas he was threatened by the supposed closeness between the queen and Thomas Seymour this seems like a good enough place to remind you that there's no historical account to suggest that Catherine conceived a child with Henry the 8th let alone him being paranoid that the child might not be his but that's how it went down for Catherine in Firebrand a mortified Catherine having just heard her rapist of a husband to get him off of her lost her baby to miscarriage and after that gardiner had all the cards to play against the queen who might have just lost the king's favor from being named regent in the case of a minor edward's ascension to the throne to having her chamber searched for investigation against her heretical actions catherine lost her place in the tudor court the real catherine part did come dangerously close to suffering the same fate as henry the 8th's previous wives and much like what we see in the film the ladies in her chamber took charge of clearing out all the incriminating protestant pamphlets and books from her quarters that saved the real catherine from getting locked up in the tower of london and she apparently even got back into the king's good books soon after around the time the narrative is in the middle of the king's and the winchester church's investigation against the queen firebrand lets its imagination run wild and aims for a more politically charged outcome of the situation so everything that comes after is something the writers conjured up for the queen they fictionalized the king's health wasn't getting any better and the more pain he felt in the anticipation of death the more his bitterness against Catherine hardened going through her chambers got them nothing but seeing as the king was still set on getting rid of his sixth queen gardiner employed dirty tactics to get her to cower in fear her horseman was harassed into giving up the details of the time she went to meet anne askew trying to keep her head on her shoulders catherine didn't want the king to find out about the necklace he'd already gotten wind of one of anne's disciples coming into a considerable amount of wealth and while his first suspects were the noblemen it didn't take him long to turn his eyes closer to home to catherine's relief thomas seymour got hold of the necklace her life hinged on it's hardly a matter of shock that in the scheme against the queen the parts taken were seldom morally right the king wanted her gone and seeing as the seymours were in a vulnerable position in the court edward seymour was practically threatened into going against catherine edward turned to thomas in the hopes that there'd be something to prove that the queen had been unfaithful but what a terrified and selfish thomas handed him was even better catherine was betrayed and as the king grabbed the necklace the proof of her true devotion in his hand catherine was locked up in the tower to count her days henry might have come off irritated by prince edward and elizabeth's longing for their mother but there was something about his desperation to not hear a word about her that betrayed his dilemma over the decision to kill catherine in firebrand's ending the film goes a bit too far in rewriting history catherine was instructed to beg for the ailing king's mercy but she was nothing if she didn't hold on to her convictions she didn't believe in the king's and bishop's power in telling people how to best serve their god so even though the king was evidently getting soft over what he thought was his love for catherine she didn't want to plead for her life 
the circumstances were perfect really henry's infections had gotten bad enough for his subjects to expect that he'd die any day now so instead of cowering before him catherine accepted that she'd go to hell for what she was about to do and hoped that the king was ready to join her far from what happened in real life in the ending sequence of firebrand catherine suffocated the old feeble hateful henry to death no one suspected the queen of this extreme act of treason and since her influence had made henry the 8th change his mind about elizabeth and mary's places in the tudor dynasty they didn't just owe their education and intellectual growth to their stepmother but also their claim on the throne the title card right before the credit rolls in is yet again almost wishful thinking on firebrand's part it says that elizabeth the first reign wasn't defined by men and war i leave it up to you to form your own opinion about that statement but if you ask me firebrand does a fair bit of whitewashing of some unpleasant truths in its attempt to politicize a story that didn't need all these deviations to truly be political catherine parr was a formidable woman a brave author a loving stepmother and a worthy queen even without kareem anous's film sensationalizing her story with fiction so thank you for watching this video and do share your thoughts in the comment section about firebrand hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to get your weekly dose of cinema and series see you in the next one and for the time being we're signing off bye